Welcome to the Language and Society podcast. This is Neda Salashur and today we want to talk about social media and echo chambers. Right. Well, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, if this is the first time you've joined us on Language and Society, it might be worth I explain the purpose behind the podcast series. Really, I hope to touch and elaborate to an extent on key and thought-provoking social issues pertaining to our global societies. And in doing so, um, I hope to bring to focus the role that language plays in all of it. Every now and then, I invite prominent international scholars and experts onto the program to explore specific topics and disciplines. I know we have a lot of educators, uh, social science enthusiasts, as well as linguists who listen to this podcast series, and some who've reached out and have let me know that they're sharing these podcasts within their communities, with their students and in their classrooms. And so I just wanted to take uh, this opportunity to thank you, to thank you for your support, thank you for your feedback, and thank you for hopping on this ride with me. Now, if you're listening to this podcast, you've probably accessed it from either one of the numerous podcast applications such as Spotify, CastBox, Google Cast, or maybe you've accessed it via a link on social media platforms. The topic of social media is one that I've actually been wanting to talk about in my podcast for quite some time now. One of the reasons being that my doctoral studies investigated dominating discourses on migrants in New Zealand media. But I'm also fascinated by the role that media plays on shaping public perceptions and public opinions. And, well, being trained to analyse media texts and media discourse. I find myself regularly and even subconsciously scanning and analysing what is said and heard on media platforms to see if there are any patterns or dominating discourses. But of course, I'm not the only person interested in studying and analysing human behaviour on social media. There actually is a whole discipline area dedicated to this. As a result of the increasing integration of technology into our lives, what we see is unprecedented volumes of data on society's everyday behaviour. And such data opens up new and exciting opportunities to work towards a better understanding of our complex systems. This is done through a relatively new discipline known as computational social science, otherwise known as CSS. Now, CSS lies at the intersection of social science theory, um, statistical and research methods, as well as computer science, and is gaining rapid traction. Now, I won't delve too deep into this discipline, but um, CSS is a great framework to analyse public perceptions on social media platforms. And I think it's important that we bring visibility to these new and emerging disciplines as I acknowledge an ongoing struggle that graduates and students from non-STEM fields are going through at the moment to remain relevant in an era where governments and universities all around the world are prioritising STEM disciplines. So for some, this area may be worth exploring more. Now, Coming back to social media, and um, for some, social media may be associated with a whole load of confusion and extra work and loss of time. I know I generally have a habit of resisting before I get on any mainstream social media platforms. Um, for others, however, social media is inevitable. Once you're on social media, it's easy to get into the mindset that if someone is not on social media, they're basically non-existent. <laughs> so in terms of uptake, we certainly have both extremes. And of course, we have a whole load of grey in between. 
that is, people who have a social media account, but really use it mainly to consume information rather than produce content or share anything personal about themselves. So it's fair to say that we have different takes on social media, but I'm sure we would agree that in a way it has become inevitable and therefore we need to have conversations about its risks and challenges. And of course, before I start discussing one of the many risks that experts and scientists associate with social media, I need to point out that there is no doubt that social media, like any other type of media, has many benefits. Um, the first and most focal benefit is probably that it connects people. And we've seen how it has kept people connected during the current global pandemic. And of course, another strong argument in favour of social media is that it provides a creative outlet for many. We see this particularly with platforms like Instagram, which is a designer's heaven, looking for interior design ideas, just type your preferred design concept, Hampton style or Scandinavian, press search and you're seconds away from being flooded with design ideas. Or TikTok, a platform that I'm not particularly fond of, to be honest. But there's no doubt that it has provided an outlet for people, especially our young generation, the tweens and the teenagers, to express themselves through singing, dancing, comedy and lip syncing. And for me personally, social media allows me to be creative in the sense that I can create educational content that I don't get to create in my everyday job. And so... I understand and appreciate how it is seen and being used as a tool to enable and empower our creative sides. But in this episode, we want to focus on the risks. And I could go on about the risks associated with social media for hours, from the role that bots and fake accounts play, to fake news, and more recently, new artificial intelligence, which is being explored called deep fake a deeply disturbing new technology, I must say. But maybe we can explore these aspects in future episodes. Because in this episode, there is one particular aspect that I want to focus on. And that is how social media contributes to the polarizing of social and political opinions and perspectives. And what we mean by polarization is basically a growing gap in opinion among members of society. So when talking about political polarization, for example, it means the divergence of political attitudes to ideological extremes, such as the far left and far right. So a good example of this would be the United States and what we saw with the elections recently and how polarized the nation had become, um, some who strongly supported Donald Trump and some who absolutely despised him. And what is interesting here is how in some contexts we no longer have a common ground or some form of a shared understanding of reality. And what I mean by a common ground or a shared understanding of reality is, oh, I might actually give you an example, a really simple example that I've used in the past. If I hold up a piece of white paper and say to you, what color is it? If you disagreed with me, you might say, well, it's not white, it's actually ivory. Or you might say, it's actually light grey or beige. But you wouldn't say it's black. And that's what we are seeing in polarised countries at the moment, that there is no shared common view of reality. What one person perceives as truth, the other perceives as fake news and vice versa. And of course, I use the example of the USA because it's one that we've recently experienced or we've recently observed on the news. But it's important that I point out that this idea of polarization isn't just unique to the United States. We see it in many other countries. We see it in India under Modi's leadership, in Turkey under President Erdogan's leadership, or in Poland and in Brazil. The list goes on. Because polarization is shaking societies all across the world, from new democracies to very long established ones. But why is it that we are experiencing increasing political and social division globally? 
Well, some scholars have said that it's partially a result of social media. I use the word partially here because it's important to acknowledge that the polarization we see in some societies around the world is not just a result of social media. In the book, Democracies Divided, written by author Thomas Carruther, who is a senior vice president for studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and a leading authority on international support for democracy, human rights governance, the rule of law and civil society. He talks about what countries who are experiencing social and political division and polarization share in common. In other words, what specifically is driving social and political polarization in these countries? And well, in summary, these are one, autocratic leaders, otherwise known as dictators, two, corruption and patronage, and three, yep, you've guessed it, the disruption of the media industry brought about by social media. And it's this latter driver that I want to continue unpacking a little bit more. Social media and their intelligent algorithms have created what social scientists are now calling echo chambers. In discussions of news media, an echo chamber refers to situations in which people's beliefs, say beliefs about social, cultural and political topics, are reinforced by communication and repetition inside a closed system which is insulated from rebuttal. In other words, the way social media algorithms as well as other online technology work is you basically see more of what you want to see, more of what will confirm your biases and opinions. And I'm going to break this down as there may be listeners among us who are not avid users of social media. Basically, imagine I support the Turkish president Tayyip Erdogan or have some form of vested interest in Turkish politics. So naturally, while I'm browsing on social media platforms, I will go looking for posts and content that talk about him or about Turkish politics. And when I find it, I'll read it and then I'll push that like button or that follow button. I might even decide to share it with a few friends to say, I told you so. Because, well, that's what we people generally do. And to an extent, it's actually part of human nature. In their article, Me, My Echo Chamber and I, Introspection on Social Media Polarization, Gilani and his fellow scholars talk about this preferential treatment as being called homophily. Homo as in the Greek prefix meaning same and philly which means love. So homophily in this context is our tendency to surround ourselves with others who share our perspectives and opinions about the world. But the problem with homophily is when it comes to politics or culture Homophily can actually intensify tribal mindsets and produce echo chambers that degrade the quality, safety and diversity of discourse online. So as I do this, as I read, like, share and follow content or users that support my political, cultural and social viewpoints, the algorithms are busy working at the back and analysing my behaviour on their platforms. They see and pick up patterns wherein I'm liking specific posts and content, and they are then able to put together a blueprint of what my worldview and my values look like. Just to exemplify, and I'm making this completely up, but for example, it could be that by analysing my media account, the blueprint picks up that Neda is interested in Kim Kardashian's, I'm not, <laughs> fitness videos and animals. Now, from then onwards, when there is content that is in line with or supports my values or my worldview, the algorithms deliberately expose me to that content or information. Why do they do this? Simply to keep their users engaged. Because social media platform success is defined as having high numbers of engaged users as that means they become very appealing to businesses who want to advertise on them. So over time, it is as if I end up in some sort of a vacuum, wherein every morning I wake up, 
the posts and content I see and read will be the ones that reaffirm my own opinions and perspectives. Now, in the long run, what this may do is it may give me a false sense of confidence about my opinions. It could make me think that what I'm thinking is true because a lot of other people are thinking the same way as me, because all the accounts and content that I'm exposed to support my perspective on the topic. And it is for this reason why we refer to this phenomenon as an echo chamber. Because social media acts like a well, wherein if you shout hello, what you hear back is hello. Or in social media terms, if you like Black Lives Matter content, what you get exposed to is Black Lives Matter content. Social media platforms ensure that we only get a single side of every story. And this then gives me a sense of entitlement. Entitlement not only to hold strong opinions, but to strongly oppose and resist any other opinion that goes against it. And so over time, online social communities become fragmented by echo chambers because people are able to seek out information that reinforces their existing views with little encounter of opposing views. So it's not that diverse and opposing views are not out there. They are out there more than ever before as we are living in an era where thanks to social media everyone has a voice. It's just that each person will be more likely encouraged by the algorithms to stick to their own pack, so to speak. This polarization is particularly concerning for the quality and nature of civic discourse, as it creates barriers to us having rational discussion about fundamental socio-political topics which affect our lives. We need to be able to have the humility to give in and surrender to good sound arguments in debates and discussions, even if the argument which is being presented is not palatable to us or our worldview. And of course, if there is one thing that years in academia as a social scientist has taught me, is that we shouldn't hold very strong opinions about things, as there are so many contextual nuances involved. Okay, so up to now, we know that in certain contexts and under certain circumstances, we have the potential to be living in echo chambers as a result of the algorithms on our social media platforms. So we've discussed the problem, but what can we do about it? I think it's really important that we talk about some practical tips in these episodes, because I don't want us to ha just end up with having identified the problem but not to have much to say about how to remedy it. So if you agree with what's presented in this episode so far, the good news is you've already taken the first step because the first step is to identify the problem. And I can't reiterate enough how important this first step is. My father always used to say that being able to identify and see the problem means you're already halfway through to solving the problem. First, we need to understand and accept that there is a problem or a potential problem. And the reality is that many in our societies are totally oblivious to what an echo chamber is and how social media algorithms work. And that's exactly why we need to start talking about this topic in our communities while at the same time becoming conscious of the potential echo chambers in our own lives and on our own platforms. This is probably the first and most important step. And that takes me to my next tip, which is, where possible, explore changing your social media feed settings. I say where possible, as unfortunately, some social media platforms don't really offer you much of a choice. But some do allow you to change the order in which information and content is given on your feed. Changing this setting is worth the effort and you will notice immediately that you're seeing posts from friends who have been hidden for years. There are also some really interesting applications and web extensions that you can use to help you escape your bubble. The browser extension, literally called Escape Your Bubble, injects right-wing views into liberals' feeds and vice versa. So based on where you fall on the political spectrum, you get exposed to the opposing views. 
On their website, they define their purpose as the following. They say, our dream is simple. We are appalled by the amount of hatred we have for our political opponents here in America. And so we want to change that. We have built a Chrome extension to help us all out. It works by breaking through your siloed online experience and inserting into your Facebook newsfeed articles and pictures which shed your political opponents in a positive light, challenge your worldview and encourage you to get to know the other side better. So a very interesting um, extension um, for anybody who is interested in exploring it further. And there are also search engines such as DuckDuckGo um, which guarantees to protect your privacy um, so you don't get targeted ads popping up everywhere. Finally, if you're a content creator like myself and have a following, when discussing social and political topics on your platforms, do ask your followers if they disagree with you. And if they do, why? Why do they disagree? Invest time in discussions with people, especially those who disagree with you. I think we should be able to have rational discussions with people who disagree with us. And going back to what I said earlier, I think it's important that we have the humility to, you know, to surrender to good sound arguments or good evidence. Right, so I think we've reached the end of this podcast episode. I hope there was some food for thought for you in there. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts and receive your feedback. And of course, I'm relying on you sharing these podcast episodes with your colleagues, friends and your wider social circles. You've just been listening to Language and Society and my name is Neda Salashur. Till next time, do take care.